Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister. Friends and fellow Singaporeans, good evening. This is my first National Day rally after the general elections. My team have a fresh mandate to implement our programs, to grow the economy, to improve our education system, to expand our healthcare system, housing, transport, and so on. I have a new team, it's settling in. It's gelling together to tackle both long-range issues as well as immediate challenges which Singaporeans face. From a national perspective, Singapore has done very well. Over the last five years, we ran into the worst storm we've ever encountered since independence. But we took bold and decisive measures, especially the resilience package and the jobs credit. And the measures worked and sheltered us from the worst of the storm. So if you look and compare today with five years ago, I think we can honestly say incomes have gone up some, people have jobs and homes, our city has been upgraded, and Singapore is better. But unfortunately, it was such a powerful storm that even with a big and strong umbrella, we couldn't avoid getting a little bit wet. And so Singaporeans felt the discomfort, the anxiety, and compounded because of the rapid changes which we couldn't predict and which we always worried what tomorrow will bring. After the crisis passed, our economy bounced back faster than we had expected, which should be good news, but it also brought its own problems. Our infrastructure programs couldn't quite catch up, so our housing program, there was a shortage. People became very anxious over the HDB flats. Our public transport became a bit more crowded than it should be, and people noticed. So from a personal perspective, many citizens feel pressure in their daily lives, even though you see the growth figures. Last year, 14.5%, this year so far, nearly 5%. And they ask themselves, why has my cost of living gone up? Can I or my children afford to buy homes for ourselves? What about my health care costs as I grow old? In short, Singapore may be progressing, the country may be moving forward, but am I part of this progress? Am I part of this story? I can fully understand and empathize with these concerns because it has been a difficult ride, bumpy, stormy, and causing anxiety from time to time. But we are tackling these problems, building more flats, improving our public transport, managing the inflow of foreign workers and immigrants. It will take a while to solve these problems because they are big and complicated issues, but we are heading in the right direction and things will gradually get better. So please be patient and at the same time, please try and look beyond these problems which we can see as immediate concerns to the longer term wider world issues which affect us and will be of strategic importance to us. We've got to implement long-term policies to keep Singapore growing because otherwise, without the right long-term strategy, there will be no Singapore success story for any Singapore citizen to be part of. Our outlook depends on our getting our strategies right but it also depends on our external environment. And if you look around you in the external environment, you don't have to look very hard to notice some dark clouds are gathering. America and Europe have major problems still unresolved and which are not just problems for themselves, but which pose a serious risk to world growth. In Europe, you've heard of Greece, and Greece has been bailed out now for now, again. But the markets know that this problem hasn't gone away. What they've done 
is to kick the can down the road. And sooner or later, it's going to pop up again. And it's not just a problem of Greece. It's spread beyond Greece. And there are issues with Portugal, Ireland. These can be managed. Spain, Italy, bigger. Not so easy to manage. And the banks which lend to these countries, which may be French banks, German banks, banks in Britain, that's an even bigger problem still. And so, Europe is troubled. America is also troubled. S&P downgraded America's long-term debt from AAA to AA+. Just what does it mean? It highlights serious long-term problems. Government is spending too much. The fiscal deficit is unsustainable. And if they don't correct it, they are heading for trouble. But they are not able to correct it because there are deep divisions between the Democrats on one side and the Republicans on the other as to what to do. One side wants to make sure taxes are never raised. The other side wants to make sure benefits are never cut. And therefore, the deficit isn't going to go down. And therefore, confidence and growth in the longer term is not going to return. So that's the reason why over the last two weeks you have seen the financial markets go up and down and if you are investing in the stock market, I'm sure every day you'll be looking at a Blackberry, seeing whether it's gone up or gone down. But the volatility is only a reflection of the real issue and the real issue is that investors around the world lack confidence that the governments will be able to make the hard decisions and to resolve the problems which are deep and very serious. In Asia, with this global backdrop, China, India and the emerging markets are doing quite well. But if America and Europe go into another recession, then I think China and India and the emerging economies will also be affected, will also be vulnerable. And therefore, Singapore has to be watchful. We don't have to press the panic button yet, but we have to be watchful because there's a poss quite a possibility that the world will go into another recession and that's going to affect us. It can easily happen. And Bob Zelig, who's president of the World Bank yesterday in Australia, he gave a speech and he said as much. Now that he's not a politician, he can say it as it is. So we should take it seriously. So in Singapore, we have to keep a twin focus. Address the stresses and strains that people feel, but also track and respond to our external challenges and keep our strategies right. In other words, we have to get our politics right as well as our policies right. And if we can get both of these, then we can engage all our people to build Singapore together. And to get both right, you must start with the politics, which is what I will do. During the general election in May, it's many issues got hotly debated. And it's quite natural during a debate, issues will crystallize, be amplified, the differences will be sharpened, and people's consciousness will be focused on the problem. And this time there were more diverse views and expressed a lot more strongly, not only in rallies, but also on the internet, in the social media, and SMSs, all the new technologies offering. It's useful to have had a vigorous debate and a full airing of these views. It shows energy and concern. People are focused on the issues. So let's harness this energy to make Singapore stronger, but let it not divide our society. My government will reach out to all segments of Singapore society to understand your perspectives, to share ideas and concerns with you, to work with you to come up with plans and programs which will benefit all of us. And I think there are many concerned Singaporeans who are thinking about this, even after the elections, with critical but thoughtful views. 
They don't agree with everything the government has done or is doing, but they understand, acknowledge the good work and the progress, and they are concerned that we should make things better and not throw the baby out of the bathwater. And they've, a good number of people like this have written to MPs, to ministers. I've received quite a number myself. Thoughtful, cogent, extended presentations of why, why they think things turned out as they did, what they think we should do now. And I think that people like this give hope that Singaporeans want the country to progress and there are people who will want who are prepared to come forward and to make our system work better. So I encourage all those who have written to us in this spirit to come forward, whether online or in real life, and help to strengthen the constructive climate of opinion so that your government can do right for you and do right for Singapore. And I think in person, face to face, on TV, we know how to do it. Engagement online, I think we need to learn to do it better. It's not easy to do, but it's important because the digital media is continuing to grow in importance. Five years ago, YouTube was insignificant. Facebook didn't exist. All you had was Mr. Brown. Today, Mr. Brown has a lot of competition. We in government have a lot of competition. And we have to be able to operate in that space. It's not easy because it's anonymous, it's chaotic, it's unfiltered, unmoderated. And so the medium lends itself to many negative views and ridiculous untruths, any number of them. I won't repeat one because otherwise you may misunderstand and think it's true. But if you just open at random, you will see them. And we have to do our best to counter this to prevent untruths from circulating and being repeated 5, 10, 20 times from leading people astray. And after a while, you've heard it so often, you can't remember where you saw it, but it must be true. But it's not. So, our ministers have to get better at this. And you know many ministers are blogging now, Facebook, and they have to communicate in a different medium and convey nuance, policy, intentions, explanations in a more personal way, engaging people. But it's not just the ministers doing this, the government as a whole has to be more active and adept, engaging Singaporeans online. We can't be in every corner of cyberspace because there's a lot of cowboy towns out there. But there must be places which grow where people recognize that these are places which are reliable, where you can have an open debate, where different views are expressed, but it's balanced. And if you go there, you know that, well, to start off with, you can assume that it will make some sense. Whether it's right or wrong, you have to consider, but it's not rubbish. So we've got to get there, be in cyberspace, and use it constructively to explain issues, to shape opinions, to rally support, and to make Singapore work better. I'm very encouraged that Singaporeans are engaging, but I'm even more encouraged that they're going beyond giving views in order to come forward and actually to work with one another and with the government on projects which matter to them and which are good for Singapore. And I give you a couple of examples because I think that's the most vivid way to convey what are the things which Singaporeans are getting together and doing and getting mobilized on. One of them is the KTM railway line. The land we took back on the 1st of July and we are creating a green corridor along the railway land. And there are many views outside encouraging the government to make this a beautiful green corridor to add to the amenities of living in Singapore. And MND and URA and me, we are very keen on this. So URA has been carrying out an extensive public cons consultation. Uh, Kobun Wan is in charge, but Tan Juan Jin, I think, has been uh, personally uh, focused on this and talking to the different nature groups and, uh, and um, uh, 
civic groups outside, looking for creative ways to preserve the green spaces without affecting the development potential of the land which can be developed. Because there are lands which can be developed and which should be developed, because they are very valuable. But the strip of the railway, I think we can do something interesting with that. And we've got many bright ideas, some from students, some from architects, some from design professionals, and they've sent them to us. They want to use some sections as creative arts and performing spaces. They want to develop a leisure corridor, link them to our park connector network. And there are some pictures which you can see. This is uh, Sungai Pang Swa. This is, a, this is a canal. The actual railway line is just beyond the trees. But we can transform this, and here's one proposal to make it look like this. So the amenities will be for the residents, for Singaporeans. The canal becomes a meandering stream, and the houses behind, well, the property value is likely to go up. <laughs> but I think that's good. There's another proposal from a recent architecture graduate from NUS, Ms. Regina Koo, who put some effort into designing a project also around the same area. And she, her proposal is to build this structure, which she calls a velo park, which means it's a center for bicycle activities. So you have bike ways, you have bicycle, rent, bicycle rental stalls, a club, a bike cafe. You can go in and have a bite on your bike. <laughs> and it's creative, it's imaginative. And I hope we get many more bright ideas like this. And then we will have a range, a menu to choose from. And when we have a decision taken and the plans are settled, I hope the interest groups which are engaged in this will actively participate in implementing the projects. So don't just tell us what to do, help us to do it. This is one interesting project. Another interesting project is the Yellow Ribbon Project which you will have heard of, probably. And its objective is to help to rehabilitate ex-offenders, people who are released from prison, and to lower the re-offense rate, which we've done quite successfully. In fact, we have the lowest re-offending rate probably in the world. And there are more than 900 volunteers who give their time, energy, who work closely with the government agencies to, to, to do this Yellow Ribbon Project. And one of the volunteers, Mr. Philip Stan, had an idea to do this particular project. And if you read it, it says, dining behind bars. That means for the public to go to prison to have lunch <laughs> inside the prison. So first, you have to go through the bars. These are the guests arriving. And the inmates will prepare the meal for you. And it's not just a prison meal, it's a special meal because they are being guided by the chef for hire, Ryan Hong of Mediacorp. And then they eat in style. This is inside the prison, and the room is called the Changi Tea Room. And this is the chef, Ryan Hong, who masterminded it. And you see at the back of the room, they have some pictures. Those are artworks done by the prisoners. So after the meal, they have an auction of the, heart, of the artworks. So the end result, raise money for Yellow Ribbon Fund and also let public know that our inmates are working hard to rehabilitate themselves and that they deserve a second chance. And this is a sort of thing which the government cannot do very well by itself as a government department. We can facilitate it, we can encourage it, but you need people with a passion who will put their heart and soul into it and dream up new ideas like this. So that is what we are looking for. Not everything can be done through such volunteer efforts. And in government, not every policy can go through extensive consultation. Sometimes the government just has to deliberate and decide because it's sensitive or there's no time or is an issue where the government has to make up its mind. For example, when it has to do with national security or when it has to do with crisis, you can't go around asking people what to do. The government has to carry the can. 
Also, even after discussion, we won't always be able to reach agreement or consensus. And having heard all the views, the government will have to do what it considers right for the country and then take responsibility for its decision. Matters can be big or small. We receive many requests every day, and not every request to the government can be fulfilled. It could be just to waive a traffic fine or a library fine. It could be just to give a person in the queue priority over other persons in the queue. We may or may not be able to satisfy such requests, but whether we can or cannot say yes, we must always maintain courtesy and mutual respect when we discuss these issues. Government departments have to do that. Frontline staff have to do that. And every day, our frontline staff in the government de departments deal with thousands of Singaporeans. Our teachers in schools, our HDB staff at the counters and in the, in the area offices, our town council staff, our hospital staff, PA in the community centres. Thousands, if not tens of thousands, of engagements. And most members of the public will be civil, and I think most of the time it works well. But some people will press hard, and some can be quite demanding. And the agencies tell me that such cases of people being demanding have grown more common in the last few months. And the frontline staff are feeling under pressure. So, for example, there was one person who went to a government department and at the counter he wanted something, he couldn't get it. And this is what he told the staff. He said, I don't care what your policies and rules are. Your job is to make sure that I qualify as a special case. Find the rules, find the right rule to make sure that I'm a special case and I want you to do it now. Now, how would you feel if you were at the counter dealing with this case? How should you react? Can you really say yes? Can the government say yes? Then what happens when the next person comes? Say, I also want a special rule. So we have to be able to manage such cases, and I encourage your frontline staff, do your best. Be firm, fair, courteous, even when under pressure. Your job is not easy, but it's an important job. Do it well, and we will back you up. I hope the public will also be civil, even when you don't get what you are asking for, because with restraint and good sense on both sides, we can solve more problems, and we can strengthen the relationship between the people and the government. But beyond attending to matters like this, I encourage Singaporeans to come forward to play a larger and a positive role. To sort out issues and compromises together without getting the government, without needing the government to get into the loop. Best of all, to take the initiative yourself and to make something happen and to make a difference to the lives of others. One good example of this, which I can't resist showing you, is a young man who is a photographer. His name is Sam Kang Lee and he lives in an HDB block in Tampinis. And he discovered, he realized that his neighbors may see each other every day, but they don't really know each other that well. And Kang Lee is in the audience. So he took the initiative to take family portraits of his neighbors at their doorsteps to help them get to know one another. And here are some of the pictures. So through this exercise, taking pictures, he succeeded in breaking the ice and now, when the neighbours meet one another, they acknowledge one another, they greet one another, there's more small talk in the block. And when he comes back and gets back from work, the neighbours who happen to be going out will tell him, come, take my parking lot, it's free. So, this is Kang Lee here who took all these pictures. So, I think we look forward to many more examples of active citizenship like this. We are a young nation. If we are to develop and to mature, we have to harness our diverse views and ideas, put aside our personal interests, and forge common goals. Come to some agreement that this is something worth doing together. Let's make it happen.
And we need active citizens to change our community for the better. So work with us, make it happen, stand up and do our part to shape Singapore's future.